So this is just a second. And as you can see from the subtitle, I'm going to be talking about what a second is, what can happen in one second, and why we need leap seconds. Let me start by just throwing a number directly at you. So if we have a look at this number here, 12 million seconds. Does anybody have a feeling for what happened 12 million seconds ago? We don't often think of time as passing in terms of a large number of seconds. We tend to reserve a second simply for a few moments during the day. But 12 million seconds ago, what happened? That's when the UK went into the COVID pandemic lockdown. Now, whether you think of the lockdown lasting more than 12 million seconds or less than 12 million seconds, that's probably a result of how you feel about lockdown. And it's probably nothing to do with how you perceive one second of time. But what I'm going to talk about is uh, time and motion, how motion defines our uh, definition of time what a second is in terms of its definition, what can happen in one second, which is a little bit of an aside. And then I'll talk about how the Earth's rotation is slowing down, why that is, and what the consequences are, i.e. are seconds getting longer if the Earth is turning more slowly, or are we in a position where to avoid seconds getting longer, we have to add leap seconds into our day from time to time. So that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next 2,000 seconds or so. So firstly, time and motion. If we think about how humans think about time, you might think of time and space as being separate, but I'm not talking about Einstein and relativity here. It's simply that we can't actually measure time unless we think of something moving through space. So in other words, time is generally defined by motion. For many millennia, the passage of time has been measured by the motion of astronomical objects, such as, of course, the sun moving across the sky, casting shadows on a sundial, or the changing phases of the moon. So as astronomers, we're quite used to the idea of things moving, allowing us to define the passage of time. But if we ask ourselves, well, what is a second? Isn't that trivial if we know that the Earth turns once a day? And we know that the day is divided into 24 hours and each hour is divided into 60 minutes and each minute is divided into 60 seconds. Does that not mean simply that one second is that fraction of a day? And if we just multiply out those numbers, we find we have 86,400 seconds in one day. So that's the definition of a second, isn't it? Well, if you think that's simple, well, that's the end of the talk and we can stop now. But of course, there's somewhat more to it than that. The number 86,400, of course, will crop up more than once in this particular talk. But let's have a think about how the Earth actually moves. Let's think about how it moves around the sun, for instance. The Earth's orbit around the sun is an ellipse. And that means the Earth's speed varies depending on its distance from the sun. So for instance, over here on the left in January, the Earth is closer to the sun and it moves quite a lot in a unit of time. Here it shows how much it moves in one month. Compare that with how much the Earth moves relative to the sun in one month when it's furthest away from the sun in July. Now here the ellipse is exaggerated for the purpose of just illustrating this, but generally speaking, that means that as the Earth turns on its axis, the sun does not appear to be in the same place in the sky all the time, because for some weeks and months, the sun is actually moving quite a lot in the sky as the Earth rotates because of the Earth's motion around the sun, and at other times of year, the motion is rather less distinct. If we were to photograph the position of the sun every uh, day or every few days throughout the year, we find it traces out this particular pattern called an analemma. You have to have a certain amount of patience to photograph the sun uh, every few days for an entire year. But with digital photography, that's a little easier to do as you can take a picture every few days and then add them all up in Photoshop when you're done. And we can see from the analemma, this so-called figure of eight on the left, we can see that there's a variation in terms of the altitude in the sky and in terms of where the sun is at a given time. In this particular case, this was photographed at noon across uh, an entire year. So the north-south variation is a result of the tilt of the Earth, the 23 and a half degree tilt of the Earth. In the northern hemisphere, we know the sun appears higher in the sky in summer and lower in winter. And this particular image was taken 
in, from the Northern Hemisphere, and hence the sun is low in December and high around the June solstice. But notice, apart from the north-south variation, there's quite clearly an east-west variation as well, and that gives rise to the figure eight. And it's this east-west variation that's the result of the elliptical orbit, the fact that the Earth is moving at different speeds around its orbit, and hence the Sun is sometimes a little bit east of the meridian and a little bit west of the meridian at other times of the year. And the variation is more distinct when the Earth is closer to the Sun in December than when the Earth is further away from the Sun in June. So we have to bear in mind that that is why sundials don't work very well. Sundials do not tell us about the passage of time very accurately. It's nothing to do with the Earth's rotation as such. It's to do with the Earth's orbit around the Sun being elliptical. So if we did want to measure the rotation of the Earth, we'd need something far more accurate than a sundial. And I'm not talking about the length of the day in the context of how long is it between sunrise and sunset. I'm talking about the length of the day as being the period, the rotation period of the Earth spinning once on its axis relative to the sun. Nothing to do with sunrise and sunset. So if we want to measure the rotation period of the Earth, we need something better than a sundial. Since 1968, the second has had a very precise definition, and it's defined as that many oscillations of a cesium atom, or more accurately, the frequency of the microwave radiation corresponding to transitions between energy levels in a particular isotope of cesium called cesium-133. So the cesium atom has been our, as it were, gold standard. In fact, it's called the cesium standard. And there's a picture of an early atomic clock, it's effectively a device for keeping cesium atoms in one place and then having those atoms absorb or emit microwave radiation, which is then measured. The frequency of the radiation is measured and that tells us how quickly the cesium atoms are oscillating and that gives us our definition of the second. Now, atomic clocks, as I'm sure we all know, are very accurate. They are precise to better than one nanosecond, one billionth of a second per day. Or if you prefer it slightly differently quoted, it's equivalent to the clocks drifting about one second in 30 million years. So they are all very accurate. NASA are developing a more compact version of the clock we saw in the previous slide. Here's the, uh, the atomic clock itself. It's about the size of a toaster or so. And here it's being fitted to a space probe. And the idea is if a space probe has a very accurate atomic clock, which counts time very precisely without worrying about needing uh, information from the Earth, then if the space probe knows precisely what the time is, then it knows precisely where it is using its own internal accelerometers and an accurate clock, it can work out where it is. Time of course matters not only in space probes, but in terms of what's going on here on Earth. For instance, the GPS system is a system of satellites, each of which has on board a small atomic clock. And depending on where you are on Earth, you measure the time difference between receiving the signal from the various clocks of the various satellites that are visible from any given point on the Earth. And it's those times that dictate the distances that you can see indicated in red in the diagram on the right hand side. If the clocks were wrong, then you would get the wrong position, the wrong distance between you and a satellite, and hence you'd get the wrong position for you on the surface of the Earth. If a clock in a particular GPS satellite was wrong by one millisecond, one thousandth of a second, then the distance you calculate would be wrong by 300 kilometers. You wouldn't even be in the right country in terms of where you were positioned on the map. If a clock is wrong by one microsecond, one millionth of a second, then the distance could be wrong by 300 meters. Close enough to put you in the right town, but not necessarily accurate enough to tell you whether or not you take the next left turn from the road you're on. So accuracy does matter in the context of simply living on Earth as well as moving through space. Because all of the clocks in all of these satellites do drift just a little bit, and because accuracy matters, all of the clocks on GPS satellites are resynchronized as often as possible, typically every few hours. In principle, they could go a few days or a few weeks without too much of a problem, 
but to keep things nice and tidy, the clocks are resynchronized every few hours to eliminate any possible drift. So what can happen in one second? Well, as astronomers, we know that light travels really fast, 186,000 miles a second when I was a lad, or now it's 300,000 kilometers per second, which I presume is the same distance. In terms of man-made objects, two of the fastest things we've ever built are the Voyager planetary probes currently leaving our solar system. They're traveling at about 16 kilometers per second. Very fast for a man-made object, but of course very slow compared to how fast light travels and hence the enormous distances that light can travel in one second. But again, if we bring it down to a slightly more down-to-earth thought about what can happen in one second, let's just think about what happens in terms of communication across the Earth. If we take statistics from last year, we find that on average 300,000 text messages were sent in one second, in every second of last year across the globe. Something like 60,000 searches were uh, carried out uh, by Google or other search engines are indeed available. 75,000 videos were downloaded per second. I believe about half of them involved cats, but who knows. 700,000 other messages were sent via WhatsApp or other messaging applications. And perhaps the most remarkable statistic of all, in any given second, three million emails are flying across the world. It's possible that some of those might be spam. Yes, I agree with that. But still, that's an awful lot of global communication in every second of every day of last year. And I'm sure the numbers will be even greater in 2020. So it reminds you that an awful lot can happen in one second. Now, coming back to the rotation of the Earth, atomic clocks are telling us that the Earth is slowing down. Back in 1968, when atomic time was instigated, the Earth made one turn relative to the Sun in 24 hours. In other words, in 86,400 seconds. If you like, it was engineered that way. At the time, one second was defined as the length of time such that 86,400 of these time units will equal one rotation period of the Earth. So that's why the particular number of cycles of the cesium atom were chosen. It was chosen such that the length of the day would be exactly 24 hours in 1968. But we've had atomic time, we've had atomic clocks for the last 50 years plus, and in that time we have seen that the Earth has slowed down. So although a day was exactly 24 hours, it isn't anymore. More than 50 years after atomic time was instigated, we find that the length of the day is now 86,400.001 second. It is approximately one millisecond longer than the day length in 1968. So the Earth is slowing down. So why should that be? Well, we think it goes back all the way back to the birth of the Earth four and a half billion years ago. The Earth was formed out of the, uh, the stellar material left over when the Sun was made, and the Earth was rotating at a speed which we don't actually know at the point it was impacted by a body called Theia. Theia is a, a large object about the size of Mars that impacted the Earth, and whatever the Earth's rotation was before that point, it would have been completely changed by this impact. And what we think happened is that something according to this artist's impression, Theia struck the Earth, a huge amount of material was spooled off, which eventually became the Moon, and eventually the Earth recovered from the shock of this impact, and its rotation period became about five hours. There's no knowing what it was prior to the impact event. So four and a half billion years ago, the Earth was spinning quite quickly, one revolution in five hours. And ever since then, the Earth has been slowing down. And that's because of the moon that was generated by the same impact that produced the five hour rotation. We can see from this diagram that the moon is generating tides on the Earth, and the tides you might think would be pulled towards the moon, but actually the Earth's rotation takes the tidal bulge a little bit away, a little bit away from the 
the actual line joining the Earth to the Moon. So the so-called tidal bulge is offset from the line from the Earth to the Moon by a few degrees, and that means the Moon is pulling on this extra mass and is tending to put the brakes on the Earth. It's slowing the Earth down simply because of the gravitational pull between the Moon and the tidal bulge produced by the Moon. So over time, eventually, the Moon will slow the Earth's rotation down until the Earth's rotation matches the length of time it takes the Moon to go around the Earth, which is one month. So eventually, the day will be equal to one month. But it's taking quite a time to slow down the Earth. Eventually, the Earth will lock to the position of the Moon. So just as the same face of the Moon always faces the Earth, eventually, the same face of the Earth will always face the Moon. But that's not going to happen for many millions of years hence. But over the last few billion years, this has been happening and the Moon has been slowing down the Earth. Uh, in uh, uh, the opposite is also true, the Earth has been speeding up the Moon a little bit, but at the moment we're just interested in, in the Earth's rotation. So the Earth has been slowed by the Moon, so its rotation period started off as five hours, and now it is somewhat longer than that. A little interruption, okay, so, so what? So we know that the day is now slightly longer than 24 hours. So a day is not an exact number of seconds, um, so what? Well, it's just like the problem we have with the year. So we know, for instance, a year is 365, roughly 365 and a quarter. It's about 365.2422 days. And if that wasn't addressed, we know that the calendar would drift very slowly relative to the seasons. And inserting a day every fourth year makes up a little bit of that discrepancy. In other words, a leap day every fourth year would make the average year length 365.25 days, which is almost right. It's a, it's a good approximation, but it's not quite there. If we make a second correction, if we skip, skip a leap day in a century that is not divisible by 400, then that makes the calendar year 365.2425 days, and you can see the actual day uh, year length of 2422, 365.2422, is now very closely approximated by adding a leap day every fourth year unless in a century year is not divisible by 400. So that gives us a very accurate way of dealing with leap days. So what if we wanted to do the same with the rotation of the earth? Rather than try and keep our calendar synchronized with the seasons, what if the Earth is slowing down, what if we wanted to keep our 24-hour clocks synchronized with the rotation of the Earth? In other words, what if we wanted to make sure that the time, according to our clocks, agrees with the fact that the sun is in the sky during the daytime, when our clocks say it's daytime? Well, in that case, we need to add leap seconds in an analogous way to the way we add leap days. Well, actually, we don't need to add a leap day. We could simply say, well, the Earth is slowing down, so rather than add leap seconds, let's just always keep a day equals 24 hours, and we always divide the day into 86,400 seconds. So that just means we have to make the seconds longer. However, scientists would be furious at redefining the second because that would mean that clocks would have to be set to run at slower and slower rates as the Earth slowed down, and that means the definition of the second would have to keep changing, and that's not a very good way of doing science. If we have a look at the day length here, um, this, if we look at on the left-hand side, the length of the day in milliseconds, we can see that there's variation and what looks like a lot of noise in the variation of the day, this is the day length minus 86,400 seconds. If we look at that variation from year to year, we realize that's a result of the way the Earth's atmosphere changes during the seasons. Between winter and summer, the Earth's atmosphere's circulation changes, and as a result, the Earth's rotation period changes as well. In addition to that, we have a long-term variation. You can see over the last few decades, the Earth's rotation has changed by quite a bit. And to be honest, I don't think geophysicists really understand why that is. 
We understand the long-term variation, the fact that the moon is slowing down the Earth over millions of years, but why over a few decades does the Earth speed up and slow down and speed up and slow down? I don't think we really understand that at the moment. But leap days we know are inserted on the 29th of February each, each uh, leap year. But what about leap seconds? How are they added? Well, that's decided by the International Earth Rotation Service. Yes, there is such a thing. They decide how often a leap second should be added and when they get inserted during the day and when they get inserted during the year. If we look back at this picture and instead of looking at the length of the day, let's look at this grey line and the scale on the right hand side. Leap seconds were introduced in 1972 and since then something like 27 leap seconds have been inserted into our clocks. Back in the 1970s, the Earth's rotation period was 24 hours plus about three milliseconds. The Earth was rotating quite slowly back then and lots of leap seconds were introduced, roughly one a year. But notice what's happened between 2000 and 2005. For some reason or another, the Earth sped up again and its rotation period was very close to 24 hours for quite a few years. And as a result, not many leap seconds needed to be added between 2000 and 2005. At the moment, the Earth is again fairly close to a 24-hour period, and we haven't actually had a leap second inserted since 2016. So when do we insert a leap second? Do we do it at midnight? Well, there's a problem. Because if Japan insert it at midnight, that's a different time to when Europe insert theirs at midnight, which would be a different time to when America insert their leap second at midnight. That means that clocks would not be synchronized across the world and they would be out by up to a second during that day. In the world of global electronic finance, when billions of dollars can transfer backwards and forwards between international banks, that lack of synchronization would matter. So a lot of people really don't like leap seconds. We can't predict when they're coming. We have to look at the rotation of the Earth and retrospectively decide we need to add a leap second, unlike leap days, which are very reliable according to a formula. Some computer systems don't like leap seconds. If you try inserting a, a leap second in which you add an extra second, so a minute has 61 seconds during a leap day at the end of the day, some computers, if you try inserting that time, actually crash. So it's really not a, not a good situation. Some companies really don't like leap seconds. For instance, Google, rather than add a leap second at the end of the day when required to do so, and that means having a minute with 61 seconds just before midnight, they've decided to do things differently. They've decided to add a leap second a few microseconds at a time continuously throughout the day. And they do that by running their clocks slow for a day. Imagine doing that with a leap day. For instance here, why do the clocks indicate it's the wrong time? Too many glitches. Instead, we're running our clocks 3% slow during February. The joke was that Google have expanded their leap second smearing to cover leap days as well. So leap day smearing is a joke, but the problem of leap seconds is serious. Just the, United over Nations, the United Nations Agency has considered whether or not to add time signals, to add leap seconds to time signals, and they have decided that, well, in, in 2015, do we let the clocks drift or do we add leap seconds? They decided in 2015 not to decide until 2023. So the problem is still up in the air. So I've told you about what a second is, how the Earth's rotation is slowing down, and the consequences we need leap seconds. Thank you for your attention for the last 2,000 seconds. Thank you very much, Steve.